salvation He chased down my heart through all of my failure and pride Thank you for everyone that's that's uh, safe and still worshiping and praising you this morning, Lord. And we ask a special blessing on the giver as we all continue our tithes and offerings, Lord, whether online or through the mail, Lord. However, we know that we will need those funds now, not just to sustain us, but for what's coming. And that's the opportunity to be a light in this community like we never have been before, Lord. So give us the strength to do that and, and bless the leaders as they help us navigate these times, Lord. We just thank you for everything. And we know that no matter what's happening, that, that we can praise you, that the earth still sings your praises. And so we will as well, Lord. Just be with Pastor Dave as he brings us the message this morning. We thank you for all the things in this world, but especially Jesus. We love you. We thank you for him. Amen. All right, I'm speaking to you in a different way than I usually do, so I hope that you can all uh, hear what I have to say. I'm going to uh, base my message today on Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41, and I want to read that to start with. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took with them in the boat, or him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with them. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were beating into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you no, still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? In October of 1991, a storm struck the east coast of the United States that became known as the perfect storm. It was the result of three weather systems coming together. First, there was a strong cold front moving from Canada into New England. Second, there was a strong high pressure system that was already in place over the East Coast. And third, there was a weakening hurricane known as Hurricane Grace that was turning north just off the East Coast. Well, those uh, three strong weather systems collided. And when they did, they regenerated the hurricane, creating what has become known as the perfect storm. The center of the storm winds over 100 miles an hour created waves nearly 100 feet high, which is the equivalent of a 10-story building. 
And even when the waves reached the shore uh, of the coast of the United States, they were still 30 to 40 feet high. As a result, they destroyed the property, created a lot of damage. A newspaper described the effects of the storm on the Cape Ann area of Massachusetts this way. Mountainous waves hurled debris and car-sized boulders ashore. The surging sea gouged chunks of asphalt from roads, twisted guardrails, and blasted sturdy piers apart as if artillery had struck them. Beach dunes lay mutilated. The entire coastline was transformed into something resembling the aftermath of an invasion. Obviously, this perfect storm was a storm unlike any other storm that had struck the east coast of the United States in its recorded history. Another storm, namely a pandemic known as COVID-19, has struck the United States in recent weeks. And uh, really like the perfect storm, it's unlike any other storm that has struck our nation in a very long time. And uh, it's impacted largely the uh, east coast of the United States, just like that perfect storm. That's where it kind of focuses attention, but it's spread. It's affected our entire nation now. In fact, the number of confirmed cases of the virus in our nation has more than quadrupled in one week's time. So this dangerous and deadly virus is spreading rapidly and its impact is spreading as well. And uh, its impact is not only in the physical health of the people in our nation, it's also impacting the uh, economic and, and emotional and spiritual health of people in our nation. This morning I want to discuss how we can maintain spiritual health, or health rather, during the storm. In order to do that, we must maintain our faith in God. We must continue to put our trust in God. And this morning I want us to look at the story of the powerful storm that we find in Mark chapter 4. I want to discuss three things that we learned from this story about trusting God in the storms of life. The first thing that we learned from the story is that we can trust God's plans even when those plans include storms. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus taught people beside the Sea of Galilee. In fact, in verse 2 of Mark chapter 4, we're told that he taught the people from a boat. Then in verses 35 and 36 of Mark chapter 4, we're told that on that day, that same day that he was teaching the people, when the evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they, the disciples, took him in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with them. The Sea of Galilee is really the Lake of Galilee. It is mentioned 53 times in the Gospels. It's the setting for many of the stories about Jesus' life that we find in those books. However, in those stories, there's very little mention of the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And that's because uh, there were Gentiles living on the other side of this sea. And so the Jews largely voted avoided traveling to the other side of the lake. However, Jesus cared about these people. He wanted to minister to people who lived on the other side of the lake, particularly one man and that we uh, meet in, in Mark chapter 5. And so Jesus told his disciples he wanted to go to the other side of the lake. In fact, in verse 18 of Matthew chapter 8, we're told that he gave orders to go to the other side. So really, Jesus wasn't making a request. He was issuing a command, and his disciples obeyed him. And so their journey began across this lake. Normally, their journey would have taken them about three hours. But uh, in this particular occasion, of course, it took them much longer than that because they encountered a severe storm. As we're told in verse 37 of Mark chapter uh, 4, we're told a great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking into the boat. So the boat was already filling. And it means, of course, filling with water. As already uh, stated, the Sea of Galilee is actually a lake. It's a freshwater lake. It's uh, located about 600 feet below sea level. It makes it the lowest freshwater lake in the world. It's about 13 miles long and about 8 miles wide. Mount Hermon, which is about 9,200 feet high, is located about 60 miles north of, of the Sea of Galilee. And uh, the cold wind that blows from Mount Hermon is funneled through the foothills into the fresh waters of the lake. So this cold air uh, from Mount Hermon, it uh, mixes with the warm air over the lake. And when it does, it often creates ferocious thunderstorms. 
There are these severe storms often appear suddenly and with very little warning. And they often create waves that are at least 10 to 20 feet high. The wind and the waves in these storms are very dangerous to small fishing boats like the one that Jesus and his disciples were on. And the thing is that the storm that Jesus' disciples found themselves in was a particularly severe storm. In fact, it's referred to as a great windstorm in verse 37. We get our English word mega from that word great in the verse. So these disciples, Jesus, were encountering a mega storm. It was a huge storm. And that's why we're told that their boat was filling with water. Why? Because the big storm, right, with the big waves was swamping their boat. Well, the thing is, the storm that Jesus' and disciples encountered that night was a lot like the storm we're experiencing right now in our nation. The storm we're experiencing in our nation kind of appeared suddenly, right, with very little warning. And it's become a very severe storm. A few weeks ago, you know, most of us only knew that the uh, COVID-19 was a virus that was affecting the uh, people in China. We didn't expect it to have much impact in our nation. But, you know, that's changed, doesn't it? This dangerous and deadly virus has spread quickly. It's become a worldwide pandemic. And as a result, it's even having a significant impact on, our, on the lives of those of us who live here in Kansas. But, of course, the, the storm didn't surprise the Lord. He knew it was coming before it ever arrived, which tells us something important, I think, about storms. And that is that storms are often a part of God's plan for our lives. That can upset us, make us anxious, but the truth is, we need to remember that God has the ability to bring something good out of the worst storms that we experience in our lives. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 tells us uh, this, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose or plan. So when God allows storms to enter our lives, it because he, it's because He plans to use them to accomplish something good in our lives. And I believe that one of the good things that God wants us to, or wants to accomplish through these storms in our lives is to help us to grow in our faith. We're told in James chapter 1, verse 3, you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. See, God wants us to have a faith that perseveres or endures in the storms of life. In order to do that, He, he, he gives us storms to just strengthen that faith. I believe that uh, this is kind of what Jesus had in mind when he allowed his disciples to encounter the storm in the Sea of Galilee. The storm may have surprised Jesus' disciples, but it didn't surprise him. He knew it was coming. And he allowed it to happen for a reason. And I believe it was because he wanted to strengthen his disciples' faith in him. I think we can see that by what he said to the disciples after the storm was over. He said to them in verse 40, of Mark chapter 4. Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? See, the truth is the disciples had seen Jesus do a lot of amazing things, do a lot of miracles. And so they should have had uh, faith in him that was much stronger by this time. But they didn't. Their faith was still weak, still needed to grow. And so I, I think that's the reason why Jesus allowed them to go through the storm. He wanted to, to help their faith to grow stronger. And, of course, he does the same thing in our lives. He often allows us to go through storms so that our faith can grow stronger. Now, it is true that sometimes uh, the storms we go through in our lives can destroy our faith, depending on how we react to them. But that's not God's plan. It's not his intention. When he allows us to go through storms, he wants to develop our faith, not to destroy it. I remember listening to a Christian man give a tribute to another man who lived his life with a very strong faith in God. And the man who's giving the tribute has said this. He said, no matter what weather he encountered during his life, he had a faith in God that weathered the weather. You know, I love that description of a strong faith in God. If we have a strong faith in God, we have a faith that weathers the weather. And in other words, it's a faith that perseveres or endures, even in the worst storms of our lives. And we need to have that kind of faith right now. We can trust God, though. We can trust God's plans for our lives, even when they involve storms. Why? Because we know He has our best interests in mind. He is going to develop us. He's going to make us better people as a result of what we go through. 
We can also trust, trust God's perspective. In other words, we can trust the way He views our storms. We can't trust the way we view our storms, but we can trust how God looks at them. I want you to notice what we're told in verse 38 of Mark chapter 4. We're told that, uh, but he was in the, in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Now we know that several of Jesus' disciples were fishermen. So they had been fishing in the Sea of Galilee on many occasions. No doubt they had experienced storms like the one that Jesus and his disciples were experiencing. And uh, so if anyone knew how to handle a boat during a storm, it would have been Jesus' disciples. And yet this particular storm that we are told about here in Mark chapter 4 was so severe that it overwhelmed even these experienced fishermen. And so they became afraid. They became afraid that their boat would swamp and they would drown in this storm. And they began to panic. And in their panic, they began to look for Jesus. Why? Because maybe Jesus could do something about the storm. <laughs> When the disciples looked for Jesus, they found him sleeping. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Jesus was sleeping in a storm. No doubt, the disciples wondered how Jesus could possibly be sleeping in such a severe storm. And so they woke him up, and I don't think they were very gentle about it either. Remember, they were kind of panicking. So they shook him awake, and then they shouted to him. And they said, Teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? You see, from the perspective of the disciples, they sort of believed that Jesus sleeping meant that he didn't care about them. You know, friends, we often have the same perspective when we're going through a difficult storm in our lives. We wonder if God really cares about us. And I think we especially wonder when we're crying out to God for help and he doesn't seem to be listening to our cries. You know, it's like he's sleeping. He isn't paying any attention to us. So like the psalmist we cry, as it's recorded in Psalm 44, verse 23, Awake, O Lord, why do you sleep? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. You see, friends, there are times in our lives when, from our perspective, God doesn't care about us. At least that's what it seems to us. But nothing could be farther from the truth. We're told in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. See, God is saying, don't, you don't have to be anxious or afraid in the storms, Right? And the reason is because he cares for us. We can count on it. And, and he, he's not sleeping either. In fact, the truth is, you know, Jesus' days of sleeping in the middle of storms are over. He did that when he was on this earth and he was in a physical body and he got tired. And so he slept. He isn't sleeping anymore. He's wide awake. He's watching over us. As the psalmist uh, declared in Psalm one, uh, 121 verses 1 to 3, I will lift up my eyes. To the hills, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. See, we can be sure that when we cry out the Lord for help, he's not sleeping. He's paying attention to us. He's listening to our cries for help. We're told in Psalm 34, verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are attentive to their cries. He's paying attention to us. We can count on it. Which is why in this time of crisis, those of us who are followers of Jesus, we need to trust God, don't we? He's listening to us. He's paying attention to us in what we're going through. And he's going to help us. So we need to cry out to him for help. Reminds me of the words of the song, Cry Out to Jesus by Third Day. The words of the song, the chorus of that song go like this. There is hope for the helpless, rest for the weary, and love for the broken heart. There is grace and forgiveness, mercy and healing. He'll meet you wherever you are. So cry out to Jesus. And certainly I would agree with that. We need to keep crying out to Jesus, even when it doesn't seem like he's paying any attention to us, because he is. We know he is, because he said he is. And we can always count on what he says. Besides, his perspective on the storm is often very different from ours. You know, Jesus' perspective was obviously very different from that of his disciples because Jesus was sleeping peacefully in the boat while his disciples working frantically to save the boat and themselves. <laughs> and you see, friends, the, the reason Jesus was sleeping peacefully in the storm is because he already knew what was going to happen in the storm. He knew it wasn't going to last forever. He knew it was going to come to an end. He was going to end it. He was in control of the storm. That's why he could sleep peacefully in the storm. 
Those of us, of course, who are Jesus' disciples can't sleep so peacefully in the midst of the storms that we go through in our lives because we don't know what's going to happen in the storm. We don't know how long it's going to last. We don't know when it's going to end. But one thing we do know is Jesus is in control of the storm. And so we can trust him. Charles Wendell put it this way. He said, anything under God's control is never out of control. I love that, right? Anything under God's control is never out of control. It's under his control. So we can stop being so anxious and afraid. I love the series of books C.S. Lewis wrote for children known as the Chronicles of Narnia. I've read them more than once. In the book entitled The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, a young girl named Lucy, her brother Edmund, and their cousin Eustace are transported to the magical land of Narnia. Narnia is ruled by Aslan, who represents Jesus in the stories. In this particular book, the three children take a journey on a ship. They come to an island called where, where dreams come true. It sounds good, but unfortunately it's a place where nightmares come true. As a result, the ship's crew is overcome by fear. They begin to row wildly in the darkness without any sense of direction. Each sailor hears a different terrifying noise depending on the things that they're most afraid of. Their nightmares, you see, <laughs> are coming true. But Lucy prays. In fact, she cries out, Aslan, Aslan, if you ever loved us at all, send us help down. At first, nothing happens. The darkness still envelops the ship. But then suddenly a light shines in the darkness and the light is shaped like a cross. It turns out to be an albatross. The albatross circles the ship three times. It lands on the mast and it flies ahead and leads the ship out of the darkness. But Lucy knows something that no one else in the ship knows because Lucy uh, knows that when the albatross circled the mast, he whispered to her, Courage, dear heart. And Lucy recognizes the voice. It's the voice of Aslan. You know, friends, as we journey through the darkness of the storm that we're going through right now, you know, we need to remember that Jesus is paying attention to our cries for help. He's going to answer our prayers in his own time, his own way. Eventually, he's going to lead us out of this darkness and into the light again. In the meantime, we need to listen to his voice as he says to us, Take courage, dear heart. As we're told in Psalm 27, verse 14, Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. There's one more thing that I want to mention that encourages us here in this story to trust in God when we're going through life storms. And that is that we can trust God's power. The Lord is more powerful than any storm that we encounter. Notice what we're told in verse 39 of Mark chapter 4. We're told that he, that Jesus awoke, and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. The word Jesus used for peace in that verse means to be muzzled. It was like Jesus was saying to the storm, Be quiet. Calm down. You're making too much noise. You know, and when Jesus spoke those words, right? Peace, be still. The wind and the waves listened to him. They obeyed. A great miracle happened. You know, normally, if the wind uh, dies down, what happens to the waves? They just kind of keep on rolling, right? So they finally calm down. But in this case, it was different. The wind ceased howling, the waves stopped rolling, and it happened instantly. In fact, we're told that there was a great calm. There's that word mega again. There was a mega calm. You know, I've seen a, a, the calm after the storm many times during my life, but I don't know if I've ever seen a mega calm. <laughs> but that's kind of what happened here. It was a, a calm that was so unusual. And it tells us, right, Jesus is more powerful than any storm, more powerful than any force of nature. He demonstrated it on that occasion. Do one of the disciples respond the way they did? In verse 41 of Mark chapter 9, we're told that they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? See, the disciples knew that only God had the power to control the forces of nature. The psalmist declared in Psalm 89 verse 9, You rule over the surging sea. When, when its waves mount up, you still them. 
And that's what Jesus did in the Sea of Galilee. And uh, that night, you see, Jesus revealed to his disciples who he really was. And who was Jesus? He was God. Come down to earth. We're told in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, in Christ all the fullness of the deity that is God lives in bodily form. See, Jesus was God in a body. It's pretty hard for us as human beings to, to understand that. I think it's impossible. We can't really totally grasp that, right? Who Jesus really was. But we need to accept it by faith. He said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. He was God come down to earth. Jesus' disciples realized who he really was when he called the storm that night on the sea of Galilee. They were more afraid of him, really, than they were of the storm by that point. <laughs> Jesus has the power, of course, to calm the storms in our lives today. He is the only one who can stop the spread of this, of this coronavirus. He can do things that no other human being can do. Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, with God all things are possible. It's the only one Jesus rebukes COVID-19 will it ever come to an end because only Jesus is more powerful than all the forces of nature. That's why we need to pray. We need to ask him to intervene in the storm because he's the only one in the end who can really help. Robert Louis Stevenson once told the story of a ship that was caught in a storm off a rocky coast. The wind and the waves threatened to drive the ship to its destruction. The passengers who were on board were all terrified. Then in the middle of the storm, one of the passengers groped his way along a passageway to where the pilot was. When he looked inside the room, he, he saw something amazing. The ship's pilot was lashed to a mast. And then secure against the raging storm, he gripped the wheel in his hands tightly, turning the ship inch by inch out to sea. Well, when the pilot spotted the passenger by the door, he turned his face toward him. And the passenger saw the pilot. The pilot's face was calm. In fact, the pilot smiled at him. Well, the passenger quickly made his way back to the other frightened passengers, and he told them, I have seen the face of the pilot, and he smiled at me. All is well. <laughs> Friends, I want to encourage all of us who are caught in this coronavirus storm to fix in our minds the picture of that pilot's face. And, that and let it remind you of the face of Jesus. Because the truth is, Jesus is con in control of the storm. His face is calm and he's smiling at you. You can trust him. All is well. Let's pray together, shall we? Our Father God, we are so grateful today that you are in control of the storms of our life. And we can trust you as we go through these storms. Help us, Father God, not to falter in our faith. Help us to be strong in our faith. And even through the storm, may you strengthen our faith in you. And Father God, I just pray that you will help us to focus our attention, not the storm, because that's going to make us uh, our hearts to fill with fear, but help us to focus our attention on you, the God who is able to calm the storms that we find ourselves in. Thank you, Father God, for the difference you make in our lives and for the difference you make in the storms of our lives. Help us to trust you. Thank you, Father, that you are trustworthy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Your name is a star in my town. Your name is a shelter like no Yeah.